Welcome to the Yale Center for British Arts online series at Home in Conversation. I'm Martina Droth. I'm the Deputy Director and Chief Curator at the Yale Center for British Art. And I am honored and delighted to welcome Timothy Snyder to our program today. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. Please note that the program will be recorded. Your camera and sound are muted and will remain so throughout the program. I invite you to use the Q&A feature on your navigation bar to ask questions for Timothy Snyder. Feel free to submit your questions at any time during the program and we will get to them at the end. I now want to read our land acknowledgement. Yale University acknowledges that indigenous people and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticot, Golden Hill Pagasset, Niantic, Quinnipiac, and other Algonquin speaking people have stewarded through generations the land and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these people and nations and this land. Timothy Snyder is the Richard C. Levin Professor of History and Global Affairs at Yale University and a permanent fellow at the Institute for Human Sciences in Vienna. His historical work concerns Central and Eastern Europe, the Soviet Union, and the Holocaust. Ukraine has played a central role in his work over the years. His numerous books include The Reconstruction of Nations, Poland, Ukraine, Lithuania, Belarus in 2003, Bloodlands, Europe Between Hitler and Stalin in 2010, and two New York Times bestsellers, On Tyranny, 20 Lessons from the 20th Century of 2017, and The Road to Unfreedom, Russia, Europe, America in 2018. A graphic edition of On Tyranny has recently been published, and an expanded audio edition, which he recorded just a few weeks ago in response to the escalating aggression against Ukraine by Russia, and which explains the significance of Russia's invasion and its propaganda in the context of Ukraine's history and its resistance. Today's lecture is being held in conjunction with the YCBA's exhibition, Mark Quinn, History Painting Plus, which is on view until October 16th. The exhibition presents six works by the British artist Mark Quinn, whose history painting series reimagines iconic news photographs of recent years of people engaging in anti-government protests in different parts of the world. And I'm showing you here one of his large scale photorealist canvases. This is a reinterpretation based on a photograph taken by Vasily Maximov. And that was taken during the Maidan revolution in Kyiv, taken for Time magazine back in 2014. Of course, very relevant to our discussion today. I am now delighted to welcome Timothy Snyder. Tim, thank you so much for being with us. The floor is all yours. Thank you very much, Martina. I'm very glad to be with you. I'm very glad to be speaking with all of you, wherever you might be. I would like to answer the questions that are posed in the title of this lecture by speaking about Ukraine as a subject of colonial history and by closing with our belated recognition these last few months that Ukraine is a subject and not just an object in history. Um, that Ukraine has proven itself to be a subject in history, I take to now be beyond any kind of controversy. Ukrainians have had to pass a test which is far more demanding than many of the rest of us have had to pass. And I guess it's my view that no one should have to prove their subjecthood, their identity, their agency in such a demanding way. But now that this has happened, now that this terrible Russian invasion is taking place, now that a war is underway, which threatens the existence of Ukrainians, um, we can take a minute to consider what we know and what we ought to understand of Ukrainian history. But before I begin this, I want to add an acknowledgement of my own, which is that all discussions like the one we're about to take part in since February 24th, 2022, are only possible because of Ukrainian resistance. Had there been no Ukrainian resistance, we in America or we in the West or we around the world would be speaking from a very different position than the one we are now. But of course, there was a Ukraine, there was Ukrainian resistance, and now it's up to us to use this opportunity that Ukrainians have given us to try to understand or reevaluate the world that we're living in. Mm -hmm. 
I want to begin the subject of colonialism with one of my favorite stories from childhood, which is the story of the origins of Athens, the ancient city-state of Athens. As the myth of the founding of Athens goes, the leaders of the city were choosing a patron deity, choosing a patron god, and there were two contestants. One of them was Athena, the goddess of wisdom, and the other was Poseidon, the god of the sea. As the story unfolds, each of these gods performs a miracle, which will then be judged by the Athenians themselves. Athena produces an olive tree, and the Athenians find this very attractive. There's shade under the olive tree. The olive tree produces olives, produces food, and so on. This is all very lovely. When Poseidon gets his turn to perform a miracle, he takes a trident, which is his symbol. He takes a trident and strikes the earth, and an earthquake follows, and salt water bursts up. The Athenians look at this, and they're not so impressed, and they're not so pleased, so they choose Athena as their patron. Now, what lies behind a story like this? It's a beautiful story, like so many Greek myths are, but how can we imagine a story like that being plausible in Athens, in what is, of course, the cradle of our own democracies? How could it be that a tiny city-state like Athens could devote its limited fertile soil to a crop like the olive? You can't really subsist just on olives. And the answer, of course, is that Athens was part of a larger world of trade and commerce, and that Athens traded with other Greeks and other Greek city-states and other Greek settlements across not just the Mediterranean, but the Black Sea, and that the food which fed ancient Athens was actually grown in large measure on the Black Earth of what is now Southern Ukraine. In other words, ancient Athens was fed from the same places that are now being blockaded by the Russian Navy in the Black Sea. My larger point, though, has to do with colonialism or domination and the imagination. The Athenians were able to extract food from what's now southern Ukraine, but they didn't know the place well, and so they projected fantasies upon it. If you look at ancient Greek texts, for example, the geography of Ptolemy, you find that in this land, which we know as Ukraine, the Greeks projected griffins and ambrosia and fields of gold and the Elysian fields and the Hyperborean mountains and so on. Many of the fantastic features of imaginary ancient Greek geography were located in Ukraine. So this is one theme which I want us to follow, which is that he who takes is the one who's allowed to imagine. And by the end of this lecture, we should be seeing how it is Ukrainians who are in a new way taking back a story for themselves. Now, I've told you this Greek myth in order to understand how Ukrainian history is continuous, but also how it's a bit different than West European history or a certain West European trajectory in which many Americans, or at least some Americans find themselves at home is to ask how we even know stories like that. How do we know stories about ancient Greece? For the most part, this is a result of something which we call the Renaissance. There, were, there was ancient Greek knowledge, there are ancient Greek traditions. Some of them are preserved in, in Rome. Rome falls, or rather is supplanted by or succeeded by the Eastern part of Rome, which we call Byzantium. And before Byzantium falls in 1453, much of that tradition is passed on to Italy, translated into Latin, and then becomes known in wider Europe. That is a, a Western way of seeing things. In order to understand the continuity of Ukrainian history, we have to follow the trajectory along a different line. In order to understand where Ukraine comes from, we have to say, well, yes, there was Athens in ancient Greece, and there was Rome, and there was Byzantium, but Byzantium then had a more direct heritage, a heritage which is not just passing on ancient learning, but a more direct heritage, which is the foundation of the city of Kiev. <laughs> 
Byzantium in the eighth century sent out Christian missionaries to Eastern Europe. They invented an alphabet and a language which was meant to be suitable for speakers of Slavic languages. Eventually, this alphabet known as Cyrillic and this language, which we call Church Slavonic, made their way to Kiev in a very interesting set of circumstances. Kiev's an ancient city, not as old as Greece and Rome, of course, but it was probably founded in the sixth century. Somewhere around the ninth century, Kiev came under the control of Vikings who were seeking north to south trade routes. These Vikings, like other Vikings in Europe at the time, about a century later, converted to Christianity. When they converted to Christianity, they were converting to the Eastern or the Byzantine form of Christianity. That meant they brought to their capital, what became their capital, Kiev, a, a language, Church Slavonic, and an alphabet, Cyrillic, which had been formed in Byzantium for the purposes of conversion. And then in Kiev, that language was turned to other purposes. It became a language of politics. It became a language of law. And of course, that religion and that conversion left behind a trace. I'm thinking, for example, of the beautiful St. Sophia Cathedral in the center of Kiev, which is on my mind because the Ukrainian state, as it exists today, has now decided that foreign ambassadors will be sworn in in front of that cathedral. So the, Amer the new American ambassador, for example, Ambassador Brink, was just sworn in in front of this church, which was founded as an instantiation of this conversion more than a thousand years ago. Now, this is all important because it's part of a legend, which Vladimir Putin now tells, a, a kind of children's story, a sort of fantasy about how since there was a baptism a thousand years ago, therefore Russians and Ukrainians are, are one people. It's a very weird story. It's anachronistic. There were no Russians or Ukrainians a thousand years ago, nor were there modern nations. And this baptism, as I hope to have shown, took place in a context which is very different from the modern world. But if we want to follow the traditions of Kiev and Rus, they actually lead in a different direction, in a kind of interesting direction, which helps us to think about colonialism in the early modern world. So the state, which people remember as Kievan Rus, this state lasts for a couple of centuries before fragmenting and finally being destroyed by an invasion of the Mongols in the early 1240s. But most of the territory which had been Kiev and Rus, then falls under another state called the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. The Grand Duchy of Lithuania was at the time, the 13th century, the 14th century, the largest state in Europe. It was also the last important pagan state in Europe. And interestingly, the civilizational attainments of Kiev are then absorbed in Vilnius. They are then absorbed in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. So this language, which comes from Byzantium, also becomes the language of law and politics in the Grand Duchy of Lithuania. When Lithuania joins with Poland to form a larger commonwealth, these traditions from Greece, Rome, Byzantium, and then Kiev are still very much present. They are disrupted, and now we're moving on to the second part of my lecture. They're disrupted at the moment that we call the Renaissance. So again, from a Western perspective, the Renaissance is a moment of recovery. From a Ukrainian perspective, or from the perspective of Kiev, the Renaissance is a moment of disruption and then colonialism. It's a moment where Kiev ceases to be a city which is projecting its own traditions outward and starts to become an object of the attention of others. We can see this symbolically in the Renaissance itself as an age of discovery. During the Renaissance, Polish explorers visit Ukraine and they overturn the ancient Greek nostrums, the ancient Greek imaginary of what is actually in Ukraine. They find that there is no, there are no griffins, there are no Elysian fields and so on. But like the ancient Greeks, Polish explorers do find incredibly fertile territory. So during the Renaissance, what happens in Ukraine is that the ancient laws, which originally came from Kiev and went to Vilnius, are displaced by Polish laws. Those Polish laws, especially regarding property and landholding, allow for a wave of colonization and exploitation of the Black Earth of Ukraine. 
This is part of a larger European age of discovery in two senses. First of all, the Poles are literally discovering Ukraine, but also the food which they are growing and exporting from Ukraine is being exchanged for gold and silver from the new world. So it is a very intense moment of discovery and of globalization, which is intensified even further by the character of the Renaissance itself. Even as people who live around Kiev or in today's Ukraine are being forced into serfdom because of world markets, the Polish language pushed forward and upward by the Renaissance itself becomes the language of elites on the territory of Ukraine. Meanwhile, or simultaneously, the Reformation, in a complicated story that I can't really get into here in detail, but meanwhile, the Reformation leads to a situation where that same elite largely becomes first Protestant and then Roman Catholic, such that by the middle of the 17th century, you have this almost hyperbolic colonial situation in Ukraine, where the people who control the land speak a different language and are of a different religion than the vast majority of the population who are economically exploited. This leads to an anti-colonial or a proto-national moment, which is the Cossack Rebellion of Ukraine in 1648, which I would conceive of as a kind of precocious national moment, um, as an anti-colonial moment, an early anti-colonial moment par excellence. Now, the problem with this anti-colonial moment or the problem with this anti-colonial rebellion, which begins in 1648, is that it takes place between two powers. It's directed against the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, but when it's unable to defeat the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, the Cossacks then bring in another empire from the East known as Muscovy, or later to be known as Russia. Up until that time, Muscovy, Russia, had been an Asian power. A Russian explorer had reached the Pacific Ocean the same year that the Cossack Rebellion broke out. But thanks to the Cossack Rebellion against Poland, Muscovy, as an ally of the Cossacks, was able to come west and begin a process which will lead to the destruction of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. The Cossacks themselves, therefore, are stuck in between. They managed to destroy Poland, but that doesn't mean that they get the rights that they wanted from Poland. Inside what becomes the Russian Empire, they, as a separate social body, are slowly forced out of existence, such that by 1775, there is no longer a Cossack host in the Russian Empire. So in the 19th century, national stories begin to emerge. And we see in the 19th century a very important difference between the style of storytelling in the Russian Empire as it emerges and in the territory specifically of Ukraine. Now, the Russian Empire is named after ancient Rus. I say named after for a very specific reason. It's quite consciously branded. In 1721, the Russian Empire is given the name Russia in order to refer back to ancient Rus, this ancient state in Kiev that we were talking about. That connection between Moscow and Kiev is made quite consciously and anachronistically. At the time of Kiev and Rus, there was no Moscow. The city of Moscow didn't exist yet. The city of Moscow was founded after the heyday of Kiev and Rus, and it became important as a city which organized tribute for the Mongols and for post-Mongol successor states. Whereas most of the old Kievan Rus was part of Lithuania and then part of Poland, Lithuania, some of the Northeastern territories, including the territory where Moscow was founded, remained longer under the control of the Mongols. So it's a rather different historical trajectory. And the connection between Moscow and Kiev was created anachronistically and retrospectively, which isn't to say that it's not a powerful story. Stories don't have to make sense, but history can help us see how stories don't make sense. The main point is that the imperial history of the Russian Empire, as it was established in the 19th century, was above all an imperial history. It was a history about the right to rule. Whereas the national story as it emerged in around Kiev or in what's now Ukraine in the 19th century was something quite different. It was centered around the people. The radical argument that Ukrainian historians, led by a man called Mihailo Hushevsky, was that history is lodged not in the state or in the rulers, but rather in the people, 
in the continuities of culture, in the stories, in the language itself, in social practices. So this defined the continuity of Ukraine in a way which was only implicitly political. It suggests that the Ukrainian nation was there the whole time, but it was a moment before that conclusion would lead to the, the political conclusion that there has to be a state. But I want to mention something here which is very important. That notion that the Ukrainian nation was the people isn't exactly the same thing as the Ukrainian nation is some kind of ethnicity. Some people argued it that way, but not everyone. And there was this interesting mixed character of Ukrainian society, which we observe today, of course, was also very much present in the 19th century. It was hard to avoid it. So Hudushevsky himself, this great historian who spoke with the people, was Polish on his mother's side. He had a great rival, a man called Vyacheslav Lipinski, who talked about the importance of the cities and the urban populations and how for Ukraine to exist as a state, the cities would also, also have to be convinced and not just the countryside. Lipinski also had a Polish background. In the early 20th century, arguably the most important Ukrainian family and culture was the Rudnitsky family. Um, and maybe the most interesting member of it was a woman called Milena Rudnitska. They were of Jewish origin on their mother's side. Now, I mention this because the argument that Ukraine belongs to the people can be a civic argument. And at the end of the day, it's the civic version of this argument, which has won out. Now, Milena Rudnitska, let me stick with her for a minute. One of the things which happened to Milena Rudnitska in 1933 was that as a Ukrainian activist in what was then Poland, she traveled around Europe to try to explain to people that a famine was going on in the Soviet Union. And she, of course, was quite right. In 1933, a deliberate political famine took place in which something like 4 million Ukrainians were killed. For her troubles, she and those who allied with her were referred to as Nazis. Now, of course, it didn't matter at all to the Soviet propagandists who said this, that she was Jewish on her mother's side. That didn't matter at all. It didn't matter at all that she had nothing whatsoever to do with a Nazi movement. Anyone who criticized the Soviet Union was automatically a Nazi, at least at the level of propaganda. If we mark that in 1933, it becomes easier to understand what Russian propaganda means by Nazi in 2022. It just means the people who are against us and who we are going to try to discredit or destroy. But we need to pause in the 1930s for a minute because the 1930s are the dark heart of Ukrainian history. The 1930s are a moment of what I would call neo-colonialism. On the one side, most of what's now Ukraine is part of the Soviet Union. And as part of the Soviet Union, it is subject to Stalin's experiment in modernization. Or to put it perhaps better, it's subject to Stalin's vision. The Black Earth of Ukraine inspires fantasy in the 20th century, just as it did in ancient times. Stalin's fantasy was that control of Ukraine's fertile soil would allow the Soviet Union to modernize itself and to become a kind of more advanced version of the capitalist West. The attempt to implement that fantasy led directly to the starvation of millions of Ukrainians. Meanwhile, Hitler, looking upon this famine, saw it as a positive example. He too had a colonial fantasy connected to the Black Earth of Ukraine. In his fantasy, Germans would colonize the territory, deport or starve most of the people who live there, create vast plantations run by slaves, and by collecting the agricultural wealth, become a great power which could dominate much of the world. It is that fantasy and the war aim connected to it which leads directly to the Second World War and indirectly to the Holocaust. It was Hitler's desire to control Ukraine and its Black Earth, which was the whole point of the Second World War. That's central. Everything else is secondary, at least in the European theater. And that is why Ukraine was at the center of the Second World War. If we take these two neocolonial projects together, what we find is that Ukraine is, is not surprisingly the most dangerous place to be in the world in the 1930s and the 1940s, between 1933 and 1945, when both Stalin and Hitler were in power. This brings me to the third part of my lecture, where I want to just say a word about what I mean by post-colonial. 
So as I said at the beginning of this lecture, the Ukraine that exists now, the Ukraine that has existed as an independent state since 1991, for a little bit more than three decades now, has without any doubt proved its own existence. It's had to prove its own existence against a test which really no one should have to pass, but it has passed that test. As it passes that test, and as we, ref as we in the West or we around the world reflect on how we thought about Ukraine before February 2022, it's worth asking why we didn't see that Ukraine existed or why we didn't think Ukraine would be capable of such a thing as of February 23rd, 2022. Because after all, the Ukraine which resisted the Russian invasion must have already existed, right? It must have already existed, and it did. We need to reflect on the various mental shortcuts or stereotypes or cliches which allowed us not to see Ukraine. I think all of them are descended, to some extent at least, from the tradition of looking at Ukraine colonially. So for example, when people say claim that Ukrainians are all fascists, which is ridiculous, there's the right wing is the far right is far less important than Ukraine than it is in America or Germany or pretty much anywhere else. But when people say Ukrainians are all quote unquote fascists, what they're really saying is they're barbarians, they're not equal to us. When other sorts of people say that Ukrainians are all corrupt, that's the same point from a different place. They're corrupt, they're not capable of law and order, they're barbarians, they're not equal to the rest of us. Or when people say that Ukrainians are incompetent, that's just a different mental perspective claiming that Ukrainians are barbarians, they're not, et cetera, et cetera, right? We had all of these different ways of claiming that somehow Ukraine wasn't really a subject in history. And now everyone who made those kinds of arguments has been proven wrong. Now, uh, the harshest way of making this point is that we've all we've all been looking at Ukraine through our colonial lenses, and I think that's largely true. But perhaps a more generous way of making the point would be to say that the Ukrainian nation, as it's constituted itself since 1991, is unfamiliar in certain ways. It has an essentially post-colonial character, which we have trouble seeing. And let me try to characterize that post-colonial character, because I think one of our major problems is that Ukraine doesn't look like a nation to us, but that may say more about our inability to envision what a 21st century nation should be than it does about Ukraine's existence or non-existence. Let me just do this briefly through just a few points in time. 1991, Ukraine becomes independent of the Soviet Union. When it becomes independent of the Soviet Union, it does not embark on ambitious anti-colonial policies. In the past 30 years, Ukraine, rather than directing itself against the Soviet legacy, has sort of muddled through with very limited Ukrainization, with some scattered attempts to support Ukrainian culture, but all the time mixed in with a certain deference to the past. This has been frustrating to some people, but I personally find it rather interesting because what you end up with in Ukraine today is a society which is not defined, which was not constituted these last 30 years as being against something and which was never designed, and this is very important, which was never designed to be homogenous. In other words, very often when states emerge from empires, they end up reproducing imperial practices just on a smaller scale. That did not happen in Ukraine. Another signpost would be 2004, when Ukrainians successfully protested in order to defend the outcome of a presidential election. This is very important. And by the way, this distinguishes Ukraine in an important way from Russia, because this was a moment when people were actually willing to gather and protest and take risks in order to make sure that votes were counted. A very relevant issue also, you know, two decades on here in the United States. And that success in 2004 meant that Ukraine became a country where people could be pretty confident that they were choosing their own leaders. 2004, which uh, the, the moment of the Maidan and the first Russian invasion, the moment of the photographs and the paintings that we're contemplating, that was a moment when Ukraine defined itself in terms of Europe, that Ukraine had a kind of European destiny. And this is an interesting point because it's about how 
you become yourself among others, which is a non-trivial point, but it's also about cooperation. So when we see these pictures of Maidan, it's very easy to just imagine an individual or to think of a crowd, but the reality of the Maidan is somewhere between an individual and a crowd. The reality of the Maidan, you know, as I remember it, and as it was discussed by scholars, was a matter of civil society. That is to say, small groups, medium-sized groups, people doing things together in a decentralized way. That is extremely important for understanding really the entirety of Ukrainian history, but also the capacity of Ukrainians now to cooperate during times of war. Not everything depends upon the Ukrainian central state. On the contrary, much of what happens in Ukraine is dependent upon civil society among small groups, which may or may not be in the capital. Another landmark would be 2019, when during a war, because after all, Russia invaded Ukraine in 2014 to try to stop Maidan and in order to annex Crimea and to cause havoc in general. During a war in 2019, Ukrainians elected a president on a peace platform. And this president was an interesting character. He was from Southern Ukraine. He was a native Russian speaker who had a career in theater and comedy, actually, in which he generally spoke Russian. And Ukrainians elected him in 2019 to try to stop the war. He ran on a peace platform. I'm speaking, of course, of Volodymyr Zelensky, currently the wartime president of Ukraine. But the reason why this election is interesting, if we can just for a moment bracket what happened later, is that in Ukraine of 2019, it was not at all strange that somebody who spoke two languages and Russian better than Ukrainian could be elected president by a huge majority. And it was also not strange that a Jew could be elected president of Ukraine. This is something that people in the West, I think, have a hard time taking in. You know, I'm, I will confidently say that it will never happen that in America or Germany or some other Western democracy that a Jew will win 73% of the votes in a presidential election. That will never happen happen. The only place that that has happened is in Ukraine, right? Um, and But the thing is, for the Ukrainians, this is not as much of a big deal as it is for us, because I would argue their nation is post-colonial, where these differences in language and culture are taken to be normal, where certain things that we find very confusing, like bilinguality and code switching, are taken to be normal. And what I want to propose is that this form of nationhood may actually be more about the future than it is about the past, and that we may have things to learn from it. This is also interestingly relevant to the performance of the Ukrainian army on the battlefield. There are people who argue, also in the United States, that an army has to be centralized and homogenized and monocultural. I think thus far, the Ukrainians have shown us something else. Facing a foe which is far superior in numbers and equipment, a Ukrainian army, which is very diverse across a number of dimensions, has performed extremely well. Which brings me to the conclusion of my lecture and a very brief set of answers to the question in the title, which is, the meaning of resistance. So first of all, the meaning of resistance in Ukraine in 2022, very simply has to do with existence. But this is not maybe as simple as it first sounds. I mean, existence is a physical question. Have you been killed or not? And far too many Ukrainians, sadly, have been killed in this tragic and idiotic war. But existence is also a matter of knowing who you are. We may not be yet sure who the Ukrainians are, but they know who they are. When they are fighting for their existence, they're fighting not only for their physical existence, but they're fighting for their sense of self, which exists not only negatively as a sense of difference from Russians, although that's very much present, but also positively as an idea of who they are. A second meaning of resistance, I think, has a great deal to do with time, which may sound abstract, but let me just take a moment and tell you what I mean. When the Russian president, Mr. Putin, talks about the past, 
he focuses on certain moments, like the baptism a thousand years ago, or like the Second World War, and claims that those moments in the past, in his personal interpretation, to use his word, predetermine the present and future. This is a very tyrannical interpretation of time, that I, the tyrant, choose the moments, choose their meaning, and then can tell you what they demand of you in the present and in the future. Whereas, I mean, the Ukrainian sense of all this is much more scattered and pluralistic and interesting. In Ukrainian politics, and even in, among Ukrainian soldiers, you hear far more plural and various and diverse interpretations of the past and what it means for the present. We also have, especially in Volodymyr Zelensky's rhetoric, the very important idea that history is about learning and about self-correction. I'm also struck that even in times of war, Zelensky and the Ukrainian political elite in general have been able to talk about the future. For example, Volodymyr Zelensky noted the other day that Western countries cutting themselves off from Russian gas or oil will therefore be moving towards renewable energy, and that's a good thing. I think there's something remarkable about a president in time of war who's also able to think about renewable energy and the fate of the planet. The third meaning of this resistance, I think, has to do with how we all interpret the Second World War. The Second World War has been a meaningful fount of concepts and values for a lot of people. And what the Russians are fighting for is a certain interpretation of the Second World War, which put very briefly is the Second World War justifies more war. Or ideologically speaking, the fact that there were once Nazis means that the Russian leader has the right to call anyone he likes a Nazi and then try to destroy them. Now, in, in my view, that's a perverse interpretation of the Second World War. And in my view, there are very important concepts from the Second World War that ought to be preserved, like fascism as a phenomenon or genocide as a legal characterization. I think these things are very important. I think they're a normal part of our political vocabulary. And I think this is one of the meanings of resistance. If the Ukrainians lose a war or are allowed to lose a war by us, um, that will mean also that our heritage of concepts and values from the Second World War will, if not be extinguished, at least very seriously weakened. The final point that I want to make about the meaning of this resistance is democracy. Ukrainian democracy wasn't perfect. American democracy certainly isn't either. None of the democracies that we have is perfect. But Ukrainians certainly had the right to choose their own leaders. And this is something which goes deep into Ukrainian political culture. Choosing one's own leaders and being suspicious of them at the same time runs very deep in Ukrainian political culture. This war is about democracy in a very simple sense. This war is a kind of trial as to whether a larger autocratic regime can destroy a smaller democratic regime by force. And the force here is very important, and this is why the word resistance is well chosen. There are moments when, sadly, when force can only be resisted by force, which brings me back to the story which, with which I began. As some of you probably realize, or some of you probably know, the trident, which Poseidon held, which is the symbol of Poseidon, is also, by chance, the political symbol of Ukraine. In Ukrainian, it's called the Trizum. And when I think back now to that story of Athens and about Athena and Poseidon, I tend to think that Poseidon also had a point. Of course, democracy is about wisdom. It's about the olive tree, it's about rest, it's about regularity, it's about conversation. But there are also moments where democracy has to be treated as a value, where a value by definition is something for which we're willing to take a risk. In other words, Poseidon had a point when he struck his trident to the ground. There are moments where peoples do have to make a bit of an earthquake. Um, and this is something which holds not just for the Ukrainians themselves, although they're the ones who are under all the pressure at the moment. This is something which is, connects to all of us. It should be very clear that what happens in Ukraine, whether or not Ukrainians can successfully resist, will have 
waves of consequences for democracies around the world and for democracy in general, which is, by the way, Poseidon's other point. You're not living alone. Remember, he's the god of the sea. You're not living alone in a city-state. You're not living alone where you are. Your democracy cannot possibly survive alone. Your democracy is going to be dependent upon its connections around the world with other democracies, democracies that can learn something from one another. So I hope this conversation has served this purpose and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your, for your talk. Really appreciate it. I found it very moving in fact, um, also very disturbing in many ways. We have a lot of questions and comments. Um, I wanted to start with a comment from one of our guests who wanted to express their thanks to you for addressing the audience in Ukrainian when you started out. Um, as we mentioned in the beginning, your talk coincides with an exhibition at the center, specifically a painting that refers us back to, to Kiev in 2014. And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about whether and how you feel images are generating interest and understanding about an overseas conflict that to many people may feel very far away and remote. So I want to first of all, raise in connection with this question, the larger issue of art, not simply visual art, but also performance art, because it strikes me as being very important that Volodymyr Zelensky, and not only President Zelensky, but others around him, are people who are schooled in theater. And this, it turns out, is not a diminution, but actually a source of political possibility, which also makes me think of the Greeks. It makes me think of the old fashioned word rhetoric and the way that different kinds of rhetoric apply to different situations. So President Zelensky has embraced and embodied and exemplified a different form of rhetoric since the war has begun. And with that embrace of rhetoric, he's also embracing a certain kind of responsibility. And so I, I've been struck by how important that actually is because his exam, the way he presents himself, I mean, even people who don't understand Ukrainian um, take something from the way that he presents himself. I, it's hard for me to think of a leader who's done so much actually in a foreign language to, to impress people by his comportment. On the question of images, one thing I'm very struck by, Martina, is how the images that we see in the West are actually quite chaste and censored compared to the images that Ukrainians see. For better or for worse, the, the ethic of disclosure is quite different in the West than it is in Ukraine. So when I'm watching Ukrainian television or just following Ukrainian media in general, what I'm seeing is actually much starker and more disturbing than what people in the West are seeing. And so your question might have been headed in the direction of how important it is for us to see images. And I agree with you. I just want to point out that even as we do that, the West is quite dramatically censoring the images that are coming from Ukraine. And maybe that's right and proper, maybe there are arguments for it, but there's an awful lot that we're, that we're also not seeing about this war, which Ukrainians are seeing every day. But of course, I mean, of course, images are very important. And the third point I wanna make is that the fact that we have images is a result of human beings. So, you know, there, I realize that there are satellites and all this stuff, but the, you know, there are 32 reporters, I think, at, the, at present who have died in Ukraine during this war. The images that we have generally come from people who are willing to take risks. So like the creation of images is a very humanistic operation from the beginning. Oh, the end of it is a you know, collection of digital data. The beginning of it is a person who is taking risks. And, you know, um, like I think of, there was a guy called, who I met once or twice, called, called Max Levin, who's a Ukrainian photojournalist who said that like every Ukrainian photographer wants to take the picture that ends the war, you know? And maybe that's the picture that does it, but the picture begins with a photographer. And so with, with the images, I'm thinking of all the Ukrainian journalists who are at work, not only Ukrainians, but most of them are. And a lot of the Western journalists are being helped by Ukrainian journalists. And I'm thinking of the risks they're taking, but I'm also thinking of the general point that if you wanna have images, you have to have people. You have to have people who are going out there and taking those images. If like we compare this to the Holodomor, the famine of 1933, there are almost no images because the Soviet regime succeeded in preventing those images from arising in the first place. So I'm gonna take the question as a kind of opportunity to just express appreciation for the people who are generating the images. Yes, hear, hear. 
It's interesting what you said. I mean, I feel like we often think of images as circulating quite freely and globally, but it seems as though there's a certain limited number of images that we're getting here that are very different to what Ukrainians are seeing, which I, I, I find that quite a salient point. I hadn't thought about that before. Um, perhaps related to that, a question about the sort of information that's circulating in social media, the sort of availability of information, which seems quite fluid. Do you feel this is creating a new situation where traditional propaganda and its approaches are becoming harder to manage? So I think this is one more example of how, this war is one more example of how one has to be conscious of the use of social media because there are, you know, speaking to the reporters, there are lots of good reporters who one should be, I think, consciously following on social media. One should be trying to follow those people who are actually out there doing the war reporting and make sure that one is helping them in that way and you know promoting them and so on. I think that the social media still has the, it's run by algorithms of attention. And therefore, if it's left on its own, it does tend to drift towards the things which push our buttons. The propaganda in this war got off to a slow start for a contingent reason, which is that the handful of Russian men who started this war thought it would be over in three days, and therefore they didn't prepare propaganda for it the way they did in 2014. So we've gotten a little smarter since then, but I think also in this war there was an element of luck or bad planning. And so as the war goes on, I think it's very important for us to concentrate on those people who are themselves providing the images and, and support, and like trying to be as direct as possible in the way we use social media. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, there are a number of questions about language, uh, which you talked a little bit about, um, and I'll read one of them. Um, could you talk more about the difference between the Ukrainian and Russian languages and how this is playing out in the current conflict? Look, that's a lovely question, and it's fascinating. And, you know, for, for 30 years, I've been trying to get across the idea that it's interesting to have a society where people speak two languages. It's not necessarily confining, you know, like a lot of us try to, like, parents might find it cool to have children who speak two languages, but somehow it's too much for us to have a whole country that speaks two languages. I mean, there's been this tendency to think, well, if they speak Russian, they must be Russians. And if they speak Ukrainians, they must be nationalists. You know, like that's, that's been the way a lot of people in the West have looked at it. And that's totally absurd. You know, the fact that I'm speaking English right now doesn't mean that I'm English. And, you know, that's not how language and politics work. So the question, are Russian and Ukrainian similar? They're similar, like Spanish and Italian are similar. Like the, the Ukrainians know Russian because they've learned it. The Russians don't know Ukrainian because they haven't learned it. It's as simple basically as that. Ukrainian society is largely bilingual with many people speaking both languages perfectly and with almost everybody having some comprehension of the second language, which you know, as you go East, the Ukrainian tends to get weaker. And as you go west, the Russian tends to get weaker. But in general, it's a bilingual country where people in some way or another can consume and use both languages. And for me, I wrote a whole article about this, trying to make a case for this in the New York Times Magazine. Um, but for me, it's the, the playfulness and the creativity inherent in jumping back and forth between the two languages is very relevant to Ukrainian culture. That makes Ukrainians not just different from Russians who are monolingual, but also from Americans who are monolingual or anybody else who's monolingual. A lot of the stuff that happens in Ukrainian culture, one way or another, is happening betwixt and between. And that, that is something that makes Ukrainians different. So in terms of the use, um, the two languages are used for different purposes. So, you know, President Zelensky, I don't know much about his home life, but I would suspect that he's still speaking Russian with his family, even as he speaks Ukrainian in public because it's a language of politics. Ukrainian soldiers very often speak Russian on the battlefield. This whole war since 2014 has largely been fought in Eastern Ukraine, right? And the people who've been fighting this war and dying have largely been Russian speakers. Despite all this rhetoric about saving Russian speakers since 2014, all Russia has been doing has been killing them on a huge scale. But the language of combat is often Russian, although the language of command is of course Ukrainian. And when Ukrainians are trying to catch infiltrators or spies, they use Ukrainian, which is just a dramatic example of code switching, of how people, you know, only half consciously switch from one language to the other because they know how it's going to serve them or, you know, they know it's going to serve a different purpose. During this war, there has certainly been a shift in general from use of Russian towards use of Ukrainian. But I mean, 
as for me, you know, Ukrainians have very strong views about these things, and I'm, I'm not going to insist. But as for me, I would suspect that at the end of all of this, Russian will continue to matter in Ukraine, but it will matter the way that, say, French matters in Switzerland. Like it will be an important language, but and people will use it. People go back and forth, but people will not be thinking this is, you know, this is somebody else's language. That's that's just my prediction. But I mean, the main thing I'd want to take away from all this is that it's interesting and maybe even exemplary that people are able to use two languages and that we ought to be thinking of like Ki the Kiev as a bilingual city is interesting for us and you know, rather than just puzzling. Mm -hmm. Thank you, yeah. Um, I have a question here. It sounds as though Ukraine has often been a crossroads and a borderland, which has led to cultural richness and diversity, but also lots of warfare and struggle. Is this a fair characterization? Uh, it's a fair characterization of a lot of the colonial world, and uh, it's certainly a fair characterization of Ukraine. And I think, you know, looking backward to the present, one very simple way of looking at Ukrainian history is to ask how many imperial powers were contesting the territory. And from that very simplified quantitative perspective, what's striking about the 21st century is that there is only one right now. Historically, I, mean, I didn't go into the details in the lecture, but historically it was generally two or three, and now it's only one. And of course, just one is terrible. Just one is enough to lead to this terrible war, but it's still just one. And so in that sense, there's a certain kind of progress. And then looking to the future, the whole world in some way or another is post-colonial, including the United States of America. And this question of how you do democracy in a way which is true to history and which there's acknowledgement um, in which there's acknowledgement and everyday toleration is one that really faces almost all of us who are serious about continuing democracy in the 21st century. So that characterization is fair. I would also just point it towards the future and say, since that some version of that characterization is true for so much of the world, the question of how you deal with it in a democratic setting is also very important. And since we're all paying attention to Ukraine now, maybe that's a lesson that we could draw is that you can be yourself and even defend yourself without being homogenous. You can be yourself and defend yourself without having to follow some simple, stupid story about who you are. Your story can also be interesting and you can defend yourself. That seems to me to be something which is really important. This, that people make the argument that to be a strong nation, you have to have a dumb story. Okay, that's not how they say it, but like that current is very strong also in the US. There has to be a dumb story. The people who are in charge now have to feel safe. There can't be any challenges. Let's not have any, let's not have any divisive topics, right? But what if divisive topics are good? Like what if it turns out that like that pluralism and kind of everyday toleration and a, you know, a bit of bumping of elbows is okay in forming a nation? Yeah, absolutely. Is the colonial impulse or legacy of Russia towards Ukraine a view of Russians in general or primarily that of Vladimir Putin? I don't think we can make a sharp distinction like that. I mean, Putin is, of course, very important because he's a tyrant in the classical sense of the word. I mean, examples of autocracy like this are few and far between. There's not even a Politburo anymore. There's just him and the system which has been invented around him, which incidentally makes it very vulnerable to collapse because there aren't intermediate structures that are there for when he gets sick and, and dies, which we all do. I'm not saying I know anything about his physical state. It's just, you know, the whole there's a whole discussion of tyranny from, you know, Plato through Shakespeare about what happens to tyrants. And this is just such a beautiful example of all these tendencies where, you know, he's aging and he's ever more isolated and he's ever more attached to his own ideas. So he is an extreme version of certain kinds of ideas, like that there is no Ukraine. Um, he does really seem to believe that, although it's bonkers, frankly, like it's a crazy idea. But I wouldn't make a sharp distinction between Putin and Russia. It's much more like a spectrum where mm -hmm. a good part of the population is very much in favor of this war. And then you have a lot of soft support where people are happy to watch it happen and don't care so long as it doesn't affect them personally. And then somewhere over here, you have a group of people who are willing to take risks to oppose it. I wish we could, but we can't really operate on this axis of Putin and then the rest of the Russian people. That's not how it looks. Mm -hmm. Thank you for clarifying that. I want to end with people are wondering how you feel about the future of Ukraine 
and I've had a few questions about this. And so let me read one. Are you optimistic about the political and social trajectory of the Ukrainian people and their independent and democratic state? Um, so I'm, I'm a historian, which means I'm not an optimist or a pessimist. It means that I'm somebody who sees, who tries to remember that there are lots of possibilities because in history, usually the things that people think are going to happen are not actually what happens. Like that's part of history too. Part of history is that people are generally unable to see the things which are possible and which might happen. You know, so the history is this funny process where you think like there are people in a, in a present and they have ideas of the future, but their ideas of the future almost never <laughs> come out. It's usually something else which no one else expected. And the, the existence of the Ukrainian people is a bit like that. Like it didn't really fit on into a lot of stories that we were comfortable telling ourselves. So I'm just trying to say that the future holds things which we don't necessarily see. And that, that can be a frightening thought but it can also be a hopeful thought. It is the case that wars are often when national societies transform themselves also institutionally. And I certainly can imagine, I mean, I love Ukrainian cities. Like I, I mean, it hurts me personally, you know, just seeing Ukrainian cities shelled, all these places which I've spent time in, shelled or completely destroyed. But I can imagine rebuilt Ukrainian cities, which would be better in certain ways. I mean, and this is a form of discourse which Zelensky, I think, has also embraced, that one can imagine cities which worked better, you know, which were not on the Soviet model, but which were on a more human model, where it was easier for people to gather and protest if necessary, where public transportation worked better, right? Cities which are built in a 21st century style consciously. I can imagine that. I can also imagine a Ukraine inside Europe. And I think that's something which the Europeans have to be imagining because it's very closely connected with the end of this war. Russians are fighting this war as an army. Ukrainians are fighting this war as a people. And in order for them to end this war as a people, that, that people itself has to have something to look to, some mm -hmm. kind of future to look to. And that's why candidate membership has in the European Union has such symbolic importance and why full membership in the European Union, I think, has to be something which follows before too long. And that in general, that's why this question is in a way more of a political um, demand <laughs> or more of a, it's, it's more a question of international politics because people beyond Ukraine have to be thinking about this question. We have to be thinking about what we'll be able to do for Ukraine when this war is over because various kinds of futures are possible, but the number of good possibilities increases when those of us beyond Ukraine are thinking in terms of reconstruction, thinking in terms of things like a Marshall Plan, thinking in terms of opportunities for business in Ukraine after the war, thinking in terms of aid you know, rather than loans, thinking in terms of Europeanization. If we think like that outside Ukraine, I think that will help Ukrainians be able to end the war and to look forward to something else. Well, thank you for that, Tim. And in the light of what you just said, let me just put one more question to you um, that's come in. Do you see this war as a point of potential positive development for Europe? I mean, really, it's like it's so hard for me to have the word positive in a question mm -hmm. about the war, just because it's like the the you know, the number of civilians who have been killed is much higher, I'm afraid, than we think. The same is probably true for soldiers and whole cities have been destroyed and a million and a half people have been deported to Russia and God only knows what will happen to them. Um, I mean, I, I understand the point of the question. I'm not trying to criticize the questioner. I'm just saying, you know, that yeah. I, I just, I can't leap too quickly to, a, to an answer about that, I, I think very deeply, and this was the point of my lecture, the crux of European history is integration versus imperialism. That, you know, one thing that you understand when you're on the outside looking in at the European Union is that the European Union is there to keep states going after empire. That's what it's there for, regardless of whether you were the metropole or the periphery regardless of whether you were Portugal, you know, which was a metropole or Poland, which is a periphery, it doesn't matter. The point is that the European Union enables, it enables statehood within a kind of larger political mix. And that is the alternative to empire. And so, I mean, in my list of what the meaning of resistance was, I probably should have said that because mm -hmm. it's not that Ukraine is going to exist as a state on its own. 
Like that's not how it really works. If it's left on its own, you know, then, then it's gonna to continue to suffer. Going back to another question, the way that states work, at least in Europe and hopefully also around the world is that they find ways to cooperate meaningfully. Uh, so now embracing the point of the question after my first hesitation, it really, I think it has to be a positive moment for Europe because basically Europe is getting a second chance at dealing with what I regard as fascism, but in any event, a second chance at dealing with a very large scale war of destruction in Europe itself. Mm -hmm. And the whole point of the European Union, the whole story the European Union tells about itself is that it was a reaction to the Second World War. Well, if that's true, then the European Union ought to be capable to, of reacting on a grand scale to another major war inside Europe itself. So I wish not just for the Ukrainians, but also for the Europeans, that this would be a moment of European self-definition or self-recognition and then self-definition. I think it has to be a positive moment for Europe. I don't think that there can be a Europe um, in the long term without a Ukraine. I think that this question of integration or empire ultimately gets answered by Ukraine or with Ukraine. I think if Ukraine you know, can exist as a state inside a larger Europe, I think integration wins. I think if, if Ukraine doesn't exist inside a Europe, I think empire wins. I think those are the stakes. So it could be a positive moment for Europe, or in some sense, it has to be a positive moment for Europe if Europe's going to endure. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sorry that we're over time. I want to apologize for the many of you who posed questions that we didn't get to. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in and listening. And I want to say huge thanks to you, Tim, for your talk here and for all the work that you do and all the effort you're putting into explaining what's really going on here, which in the culture of today's news cycles can be hard to fully grasp. So thank you for your work. Thank you, Martina. You're, you're very welcome. Um, thank you to everyone who joined in the conversation. Um, Vam Thiem, Dujashtiro Thank you and goodbye.